Let's say you've got your own business, but you don't know how to grow. Or maybe you're just starting out. Don't you worry, we've got you covered with Learn with Shopify. It's a limited series we're running here on the Shopify Masters channel. I'm Benjamin Gottlieb, and I hope you enjoy this episode. The idea of growing from a square footage perspective is really to not only show the breadth of what we can offer, um, but it also is, is to connect with your community and understand the inspiration behind what we do. Welcome to Learn with Shopify. I'm Adam Levinter. Have you ever been to a dinner party, picked up a wine glass, and thought you could design something better? Well, that's exactly what Martha Grace McKim and Andrea Hobson thought, along with tackling tableware and home goods more broadly with the launch of Hobson Grace, a retail and online boutique dedicated to selling quality home goods and dinnerware. Today, we're joined by Martha Grace McKim in studio, talking about all things manufacturing and marketing. Martha, welcome to Learn with Shopify. Thanks, Adam. Nice to be here. So um, you guys got started in 2015. Before this, both you and your co-founder, Andrea, have careers, established careers. Uh, so it's not that easy to decide at the same time you're going to drop your cushy careers to launch into entrepreneurship. So tell me about what was going on in 2015. Well, I think everyone around us thought we were crazy, but we were pretty, pretty fueled by the desire to to leave the corporate lives that were, as you said, very comfortable for us and were, were wonderful experiences. But I think after 20 plus years, we were both excited by the idea of doing something different, both excited about following something that really we were passionate about and having some freedom. It's all about freedom. I mean, you guys launch away from your, your comfortable careers. You get started online, but you also open a brick and mortar presence at the same time. So how did you finance that early on? It's one thing to start a website. It's another thing to go into retail right off the bat. Well, we did it the hard way. We actually sold our houses to fund the business. Um, you know, at this point, Andrew and I were not at the beginning of our careers. We were you know, healthily into to the midlife part of our lives and our careers. And we knew we needed to create a bit of a presence and we, need to, we needed to make a bit of a mark when we started. And so we felt that starting an online store at this point, it was 2015, was, was risky. And so we did, we did the bricks and mortar thing at the same time. So communicating directly with customers is a big part of Hobson Grace's success. Uh, you come from a background in PR, a background in marketing, and original content, email sequencing, I assume, was a big part of your early push uh, as you start to build out your customer base. Tell me a bit about that. Correct. So uh, for us, I mean, we have a great passion for the things that we sell and everything that we do is is curated. However, um, it, it's it's more about what the products we sell do for you and do for your life. And so we feel that life's best moments are around the table with friends, with family, good wine, great food. And these are the, these are the joyous parts of your life. So in marketing um, through content, it was all about being able to talk about why everything we do mattered. So why is this glass great? Well, it's actually about the wine you're going to put in it. And it's about the dinner party you're going to have next week. Um, it's about a birthday celebration that you're planning. And so it, there's so much content around food and drink and, and a world of wine-loving craft cocktails, food, recipes. It's, it's endless. And people are yearning for a community and a way to talk to each other about all of these, what we think are great, great moments and important everyday uh, functions in your life. The setup of the store, I think early on you had a retail storefront at the bottom and did you have an event space up top? Right. We had an opportunity to take the second floor and with a background in events, we thought, well, wouldn't this be great? So we had supper clubs. We had Jamie Kennedy was our first supper club. Um, and we we launched it as a way to to bring people together and try to 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 showcase how life is better when you when you gather around a table. Um, and then eventually, with the demand for additional products through a lot of it driven by our registry business, we ended up converting our second floor into an apartment showroom that showcased bedding, bath, kitchen items, and more decorative accessories for the home. So talk to me a little bit about 
your early days in online, how you were sourcing products, um, how you chose manufacturers. Um, your partner, I think, comes from a background in procurement, does she? So tell me a little bit about what was going on early on and how you were selecting what was going to go into the store in retail versus online. So Andrea, her background is with Tiffany & Company, uh, and she was running Tiffany in Canada. And and mine in marketing, We one thing we noticed is that there was a lot of product out there and there was a lot of choice. So people are quite overwhelmed by the burden of choice in the marketplace and consumer goods. And so what we did is we wanted to really be unique and bring together an offering that was a little more exclusive and, and focused on quality and focused on craftsmanship. And so what we did is we started by going to uh, two gift shows a year, one in Paris called Maison Yabchen. It's more design focused rather than um, tableware specific. And same thing in New York. And those gift shows really were the starting point of us finding unique uh, manufacturers. Some of them are heritage manufacturers. Some of them are really tiny craftspeople that we discovered who would make, you know, these beautiful linen bread baskets and other others were, um, you know, spectacular Italian kind of olive oil cruets that we would bring in. And they were different. We wanted to bring things in that were different, that people would have to travel somewhere to find. And we thought, no, we'll do that for you. We're going to bring it to you at Hops and Grace. And so finding things that were different was, was something that we had to go afar to do. We had to go to Europe. We had to look for American makers. And it's interesting with COVID and, and also kind of um, the trend toward small batch products and small batch craftspeople, we're finding it more and more at home now. So the buying process, it started about kind of traveling the world to bring things to you. And now it's really a, it's really a hybrid. We're finding more and more beautiful products and people who are making them right here in our own backyard. So let's talk a little bit about some of these trends related to COVID, since you brought up COVID. Um, so many product-based businesses have been impacted, both from a supply chain perspective, um, but also from a shipping perspective. There's been an increase in the cost of goods, uh, obviously longer lead times. What has been happening uh, on this front related to Hops and Grace? How have you been navigating some of these challenges? Has there been a real impact to the business? Well, there's certainly been delays across the board. No matter where we're shipping from, there was, there's always a delay. Um, and so we've turned to a lot of people in Canada. We have amazingly, have they've sprung up and come into our lives, people who are making um, beautifully hand-turned wooden salad bowls made from local Ontario wood. We're, we've just discovered a new ceramicist um, who's going to be start making vases for us. So the, the delays and the shipping delays and the cost of shipping increasing um, is something that was already on our minds from a sustainability standpoint. And so the fact that we're going to start to find and search even more here in our own backyard for for people to make things is is going to kind of mitigate those issues longer term. Um, it's hard to get a good margin when your shipping costs double or triple. It's exciting to be able to promote people who are making things locally. What have you seen from a shopping behavior standpoint? So once the pandemic hit, we saw an increase in terms of people investing in home renovations, uh, sinking dollars in into making their home spaces more comfortable. I assume this directly benefits your business or, or does it? Well, certainly it's incredible to see how people are spending more and more time in their homes than ever before. And I don't know that this trend will will ever go away, and at least in our lifetimes or the foreseeable future. I mean, not just with COVID. Um, home is a refuge. Home is a cocoon. It's a safe place in our world when global events are terrifying both from a health perspective and from a political perspective. So certainly people are investing, they're spending more time in their homes, they're investing more time in their homes, and um, it really is the four walls around you are, are a place of refuge right now. And weddings is a big thing, weddings. right? Your registry business has been booming. How did you start that? Was that an aspect of the business that was there from day one? We 
knew we wanted to focus on registry as one element of the business. And certainly we remember the first person, I think it was the second day we were open, uh, who walked in and said, do you do wedding registries? And we were literally just setting it up online. I think people love to register with us because of the fact that we curate so much of what we do and we find things that are special, find things that are different. Um, and so um, we really have eliminated the burden of choice from the customer. And and I think our aesthetic is, is contemporary, it's modern. We like to bring products that are reflective of how people live. You know, we, we try to get rid of the stuffy, the, the grandma's teacups and saucers. And we know that people just want to have cheese boards and, and wine. And, and that's, that's how you entertain these days. It's very casual, but we still want it to be sophisticated and a little bit elegant and a little bit aspirational. Where do you draw that inspiration from? Uh, were you looking at the market in Canada locally here, were you inspired by players in the U.S. when you started? We are inspired by the world of design. Mm. And that can be in the U.K., it can be in Europe, it can be in the U.S. I mean, great design is everywhere, and it's and it's here in Canada as well. So frankly, we turn to magazines we go to. We, we love to see what other retailers are doing. I mean, we've constantly got our eye on what's happening out there. And, you know, as I said earlier, we, we love to go to the design shows um, to get our inspiration because it's kind of the source of, of what's happening from a trend perspective. And we always want to have our, our finger on the pulse of what's, what's going on from a trend perspective because we like to be current. Everyone, and our customers want us to be current. And um, you've mentioned that your retail store oftentimes acts as a marketing vehicle, that in-store experience. Um, we were talking earlier and you mentioned you're moving retail locations and you're actually tripling in size. Right. So huge. Uh, congratulations on that. Thank you very much. We, uh, people might think we're crazy to triple in size. We're now we're not expanding geographically because our expansion is really going to be online. But there will always be a customer who wants to come in and touch and feel and have the experience of seeing and talking to us about how to put a table together, how to register for a product. Um, and that will never go away. And so the idea of growing from a square footage perspective is really to not only show the breadth of what we can offer, um, but it also is, is to connect with your community and understand the inspiration behind what we do. Certainly from a registry perspective, we, we started as a tableware store, but our registrants have wanted us to have more in terms of kitchen and bed and bath. So we've really flexed into all areas of the home so that they don't have to run around and grab different registries from different places. They're, we're a bit of a one-stop shop now for them. You, know, you mentioned the word community, so I'm just jotting that down. Um, there's plenty of folks listening that are asking themselves, you know, how do they expand their community both online and in store? So what has been successful for Hops and Grace in terms of building that community of customers, both early on and as you've scaled up? Well, certainly understanding our purpose is at the core of, of being able to communicate why you're doing what you're doing. And Andrew and I have always been very passionate about what we do, the food, wine, entertaining. These are the best parts of your day. Um, and so sharing this community and developing this community has happened organically at the store, but it's also been through every single newsletter we've written uh, because we communicate our brand values at every touch point that it's about quality. It's not about quantity. And it, it's about sharing life's best moments, about talking about what recipe you, you just made and you want to be able to share it with someone else. It's about how to entertain um, a crowd at Easter or at Passover. It is, there's so much to talk about. And so whether it's in the store or through our newsletters, it's really about this community of lovers of food and wine and and design. Okay, let's talk about uh, more of the supply chain stuff, um, specifically sourcing. Margins obviously play a role here. Can you share a little bit about your experience managing the finances of the business and, and challenges maybe around that? So when we started the business, we started out by bringing in 
brands and products that we absolutely fell in love with, that they met the standards of what we were looking for, which was quality, sustainability, craftsmanship, a great brand, a great story, small or large. And over time, um, especially with supply chain issues and shipping, um, it really does eat into your margin. Um, and so what Andrew and I have been working on is moving more and more toward our own branded products. Mm. It also is a way of expressing our creativity a lot more. So it's quite exciting to be able to, for example, we've been working on a line of hardback placemats that are made in England, but we've been working with Dorset Fine Arts, mm. uh, who um, promote the artists of Cape Dorset in Nunavut. And every year we have a limited um, creation of artwork on your hardback placemats. It's not only um, helps us with our margin, but with that extra margin, we were able to give back to the community of, of all the artists who produce the work. So it's very, um, it's very satisfying for us. Mm -hmm. And more and more, we are going to be developing our own line of dinnerware, of wine glasses you mentioned earlier on, mm -hmm. um, and linens to keep the cost down. Because, you know, you can't just keep increasing your costs and and um, and sharing it with the consumer, it's, it's not sustainable. One thing that comes to mind that I, I wanted to ask you about, this feels like a business that skews slightly older, but of course, uh, this is a direct-to-consumer business. It's an omni-channel business, really, really, but you do a great job uh, direct-to-consumer, mm -hmm. and Shopify is a big component of what you do. And that, that target customer, typically for Shopify business, is younger. So who is the target customer and, and have there been any surprises for you in terms of people that are getting into food and wine and trends related to that? So our customer is, is, is of all ages and it really is a psychographic when we look at it because we have someone who is older and, and has, it wants to, let's say they've just bought a cottage and they want to fill their cottage with gorgeous new tableware that feels contemporary and modern. Um, but we have their daughter who likes the same things and they're registering for their wedding for the first time. And the psychographic and the, the mindset is that they're looking for things that are sophisticated. They're looking for things that are modern. They're looking for things that are on trend um, and certainly products that are going to be sustainable. So if something is beautifully made, if something is well-crafted, has a beautiful design, you're going to keep it for a long, long time. And that in itself is sustainable. So ultimately, our customers, doesn't matter what their age is, they share the same values that we share, which is, it is quality over quantity for us. And so they're willing to spend a little bit more to get something that's made to last. Mm -hmm. Do you and Andrea think about competition or are you sort of laser focused on sort of product quality, sourcing the right goods, these cornerstones like sustainability, building community that we've talked about? Um, or, or do you think strategically about what is the next chapter for Hops and Grace and how are you going to corner the market? I think from a competitive point of view, um, our competitors inspire us. I think they motivate us. And I think um, that if you spend too much time thinking about what they do, it's not productive for you. So we do like to focus on what our mission is, our values are, and we simply put our heads down and, and work. But there's, of course, you're going to have to be constantly aware of what your competition is doing. And um, it's, it's part of the game. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's go back to the early days for a moment. So one thing that I'm, I'm curious about, and I think a lot of people listening are also asking themselves the same question is, um, when is the right time to take the leap into entrepreneurship? What are some of the considerations from a, a personal standpoint that somebody should be asking themselves? And uh, perhaps more importantly, how do you make uh, a partnership work with a good friend of yours? <laughs> well, first of all, I think um, no one ever knows how much you have to sacrifice when you start a business until you start it. But there is no doubt about it that Andrew and I both shared an incredible passion. You don't really ever know how it's going to go. Um, but, you know, the difference between someone who does uh, start a business and someone who doesn't is you just 
do it. You just get started and it's one foot right in front of the next one and one day after the next. And certainly having a partner has probably been one of the best things about starting this business. So Andrew and I, you know, we'll sweep each other off the floors on bad days and we celebrate the good days and you have someone to share it with. Um, and that that is one of the great great joys of a partnership. And you also, it is like a marriage. You have, you have a lot of compromises you have to make. Um, and, um, but certainly if you're working with someone that you like and you respect, it's, it's a lot easier. Speaking of compromises, uh, we were talking earlier about balancing home life and work life. Right. Um, what's been your experience and do you think you're doing well? Hmm. It's a great question because one of the reasons we started the business was to have a little more freedom and have a little more opportunity to go and pick our kids up from school when they were younger um, and and to be with them more. And starting the business has offered us that, but it certainly has, you know, we we've risked our uh, we've risked our financial future starting the business, and you have to think about that a lot. But it's been worth it, um, and I I do find that our children they've really learned a lot as well. As much as we've learned, they've learned by watching and observing their parents start a business and and seeing every day what that means um, and the sacrifices that, that we've had to make for mm. ourselves and for them. So let's talk about marketing on a deeper level. We have online and then we have retail. Do you separate those into two buckets? And do you think about marketing strategically online versus retail or, or more holistically? It's absolutely holistic. Um, and certainly what we market and how we market is completely directly related to what we buy for the season. Mm. Um, and so sometimes we don't buy enough and a product will disappear in the store before it gets fulfilled online. And so these are some of the challenges that, that we face. But certainly what our goal is is to always kind of have a – uh, an experience in store that that is reflective of the experience you have online. And so having the two has its challenges, but we've invested heavily in photography to um, be able to showcase our products and our products kind of in situ uh, to try to inspire you um, and to try to help you understand what that product can look like in your own home. So when you come into the store, of course, you're going to speak with someone and you're going to touch it and you're going to feel it. Um, so um, they're, they're different sides of the same coin. Mm -hmm. Email has been a successful channel for you. You've sort of started tinkering with paid marketing. What are you doing on that front? So um, as you said, the email marketing, Instagram, it's it's been very visually um, uh, focused to help people, um, you know, get a little bit of inspiration, education around the context of, of the lifestyle and the life that you want to have in your own home. From a paid marketing, it really is about expanding our customer base. So at Hops and Grace, we've developed this community. People who know us love us. And so um, the paid is really to kind of enlarge our community, enlarge our family, um, grow up a little bit more, and really um, drive people to um, our online store. So uh, paid search is certainly something that's going to be uh, more of a focus and really, you know, taking those beautiful photos that we create and, and spreading the love a little bit further. Have you started exploring with any new marketing channels that you were not tinkering with, say, a year ago? Well, certainly TikTok is is on the radar and, and is something that we're starting to explore with and essentially video in all shapes and form. But it's exciting to to be able to delve into that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the challenges, I think, related to TikTok is that your media buyer uh, cannot be the same person that is creating the content because it's video based uh, versus, say, doing paid media buying on a Facebook, let's say, where that media buyer can also be the person that is optimizing for ad copy, optimizing for creative, because you could have the same ad, let's say, running on Facebook for weeks on end if that ad is generating ROI for your business versus TikTok, where you're having to refresh the videos every few days. Mm -hmm. So as you think about video, do you think uh, you'll contract that piece out to an agency? Will you and Andrea start doing the videos yourselves? <laughs> 
everyone wants us to get behind the camera a little bit or in front of the camera a lot more. Um, so certainly, I think that is definitely in our future. Um, but but for, for now, it's, it's going to be driven from home. We have an amazing team of very talented people at the store who at least for now, I mean, we everything is at the store. There's so much happening every day that we can constantly fill a TikTok with, um, you know, what's right there in front of us. You said to me earlier something that I, I took note of that I thought was very interesting, that um, building this brand is, is not just about the products, but it, it is about the experience of selling. And that a lot of the store associates, even if they're not comfortable selling, they must get comfortable selling. Um, it reminds me of that that old saying that if you don't know who your head of sales is, it's you. Right. Um, what has that experience been like for, for Hops and Grace as a brand to tie in this element of sales with brand building itself? Well, you know, until we opened the store, I had never worked in a store in my life. Mm. Um, and I'll never forget the first day. And the people that we have in the store selling and the people who come in and work in our marketing department, they all start on the floor um, because you really not only need to get to know the product, but it, there's an infectious um, excitement on the floor because everyone that works with us is passionate about what we do and what 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 our what our purpose is and what our products are. And it's it's um, it's it's really a rite of passage now for anyone to come in and and understand your customer and what they want. Um, so I don't care if you're going to be starting a, in the accounting department. We want you to spend some time on the floor and, and understand what we're all about. How do you gather that customer feedback? Um, are you thinking about net promoter scores? Um, I assume you do some stuff on the NPS side online, but are you capturing feedback on a store level from customers? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's actually one of the most important parts of the feedback is direct and we we gather it weekly uh, we talk about it we sometimes um, it will influence our purchasing at times we've had customers introduce us to brands that we'd never heard of it's incredible how people um, want to talk about um, what they'd like to see and the types of brands that they'd like to see and we uh, we don't dismiss any feedback ever given to us mm -hmm. Uh, do you have a lot of inbound online coming from customers? And is it you and Andrea that's fielding those comments? Or, or do you have a, a team that, that handles that customer service piece? So Andrew and I have been very hands-on from the very beginning, um, but certainly we have a team that is, is starting to handle it for us, but we actually know about every single piece of feedback, every Google comment, every um, email that comes, it comes to us. I don't think there's one that we've ever not, not seen. And if we're not answering them directly, we're certainly aware of, of, uh, of the comments, good and bad. So far with Hops and Grace, email has been huge for you guys. I think a lot of listeners are going to be interested in the success of building that email list. How are you building a community? How are you attracting folks to your email list? Can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. So it really has been very organic. Um, and in, in fact, you know, people stay connected to the emails and they don't unsubscribe to our emails because we connect them to items that they're interested in, whether it's recipes or food. It's all about them and it's not about us. The subscription has been, a lot of it's happened in the store and that's one of the benefits of having a bricks and mortars is that, um, you know, with every sale we ask people uh, they'd like to be part of this. It's news, it's information, it's trends, it's uh, it's it's local local information. Um, and so it's a one, it's a, it's a slow process. It's one by one by one. Of course, we've got um, promotions that sometimes will drive people to sign up for the newsletters, um, contests, um, but certainly it's um, it's been a, a slow and, and exciting build because once you get someone on your list, um, they tend to be incredibly loyal. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it's a great thing that they don't unsubscribe. I think a lot of folks would also be interested in hearing about how you sequence things once they've purchased something. So if they're on that email list um, for the first time and you want to build that relationship, how often do you reach out to them by email? How often do you send these emails? Well, certainly it started out once every week and then it built to maybe twice a week. And when COVID hit, we realized that with a store 
uh, completely locked down, um, that we needed to kind of um, increase the amount of communication that that we had with our customers, and they they stuck with us right right through it. Um, so every piece of news they needed to get into their inbox. Um, now that that things are kind of calming down a bit, there is a little. Um, bit of malaise in terms of too much email. We all get them in our inbox and we all start to unsubscribe. And so we really are trying to balance out just the, just the right amount. Um, so uh, certainly, you know, it's a bit of a test and learn um, with every, no matter what you're selling, it's, it's different for every category, but certainly for us, you know, we try to max out it maybe three times a week at the most. I mean, you come from that PR background, but a lot of folks I think are um, not so confident writing copy, uh, not so confident writing these emails. So how do you handle that piece? Is it you that does all the writing? Have you built a team that writes uh, all the copy and content that goes into these emails? So it's mostly been me from day one um, and still mostly is, although we, I have a team member now who's incredible and she's, she's learning about tone of voice and style. And um, so that's exciting because it allows me to uh, do a few other things in the business that uh, that have been dying to do, like delve into our private label and and other things like that. Do customers reply to those emails? Do you allow them to, or are they no reply emails? Oh no, they they reply, and we love to hear from them. We love to hear from them. They we had one customer tell us that we really made lockdown bearable for her. We'd send out recipes. We'd send out a little note of support along the way. So our Emails are very, very personal to us. And so because we write them, you know, almost the day we send them, they're also incredibly current. There's, there's nothing kind of prepackaged. So any advice I would give out would just be to write, write from your heart and, and write about what's going on right now and try to connect what you're doing to, to the world about you. What about capturing emails online? Um, are you doing pop-ups? Are, 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 you, are you doing well capturing uh, emails digitally versus in store? Yes, it's definitely a combination. And it's just when you talk about omnichannel and and it, some of the benefits of omnichannel are that you're able to capture things in two different places and then balance them against each other. And it certainly doesn't doesn't hurt. Yeah. Aspirational, emotional. Uh, it, it's great. It's a great story. Hops and Grace. Uh, where could folks learn more about what you guys are doing and follow you on social? Of course, Instagram is is really where you're going to want to go. Um, and of course, our website. But I, I suggest Instagram is a great, great place to start and uh, just follow us and, and join the community. Martha Grace McCam is the co-founder of Hops and Grace. Thanks for chatting with us today. Thank you so much, Adam.